You're listening to The Big Cast, your source for the latest in financial technology. Brought to you weekly by the Best Innovation Group with your hosts, John Best and Glenn Servati. Welcome to another edition of The Big Cast. My name is Glenn Servati on behalf of the Best Innovation Group, where we like to do cool things with financial technology. And uh, we continue to look back at uh, the, the Venture Tech Conference, which I sang the praises of a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, actually, last week's episode, if you didn't get a chance to listen, you should definitely go back uh, our annual Thanksgiving podcast, where we uh, talk about the things in the fintech and credit union world that we are particularly thankful for. One of the things I'm thankful for is the fact that we can get together for these conferences again, and the content and the, you know, the networking has been as good or better than ever. I think because people are just so grateful to be back in person again at these things. But Venture Tech was definitely one of those highlights. So we'll be talking to three folks that we uh, interviewed there. Chrissy Cole of Penny Finance, which was part of the launch party. A little bit more on that in a second. Seth Brinkman of QCash, uh, CEO of a uh, QSO that was recently acquired. And Mitt Rutledge, the uh, co-founder of Virtus AI, along with Richard Soule of the credit union Wellbe Financial, talking about uh, the early beta process and the collaboration between their organizations on the uh, on the AI side. So that coming up in just a few minutes. Thanks, as always, to our friends at CUNA for their sponsorship. Uh, when I my first thing I'm thinking of right now at CUNA is the the GAC, which uh, the the Government Affairs Conference, which takes place every spring. This year it will be in Washington D.C. as it always is. Uh, it's a little bit later for whatever reason, March third through seventh, and I think is going to be a particularly interesting one, given that it'll be the first event that I'm aware of that'll be the combined CUNA and NAFQ. Uh, that will be working under the uh, the banner of America's credit unions going forward. Uh, this has traditionally been a CUNA event, but now those two organizations will be one, and the, the merger was approved by both of their um, memberships. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about that. If you're not a regular, if you, if you are a regular to, uh, at GAC, you know that it's worthwhile. And if you're not, I would strongly encourage it, particularly this year, and if you got a few extra dollars burning your uh, year-end 2023 budget still, uh, the, the registration page is already open out there at cuna.org if you want to get your registration in before the end of the year. I'm going to be uh, short with my early note. Not a whole lot of news to cover right now because we have so much good content uh, from our interviewees. And besides, the biggest story is uh, Sam Altman and OpenAI. And by the time you're listening to this, his uh, key card access will probably have changed two more times. So I don't want to wind up being obsolete by the time you listen to this one. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'll get back to the and, and we will be doing a, a, a recap of our biggest stories of 2023 and what we think really moved the world in fintech and credit unions. Uh, that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. But for this week, as I said, Venture Tech, uh, the first day of Venture Tech, they uh, tackled something a little bit different called the launch party, which was for uh, not even necessarily CUSOs, startup fintechs that were not quite as far along interested in looking into collaboration with credit unions. There were 10 of them. And um, actually, I'm, the, to me, the line wasn't quite as distinct as I expected it to be. Some of them were actually relatively far along, and maybe because they actually had act gained some traction since the original process of uh, putting the agenda together. For whatever reason, though, my favorite of the bunch was a company called Penny Finance. Uh, Chrissy Cole is the founder, and uh, we had a chance to catch up with her after the conference. I'm here with Chrissy Cole, who is the founder and CEO of Penny Finance, one of the companies that was part of the Venture Tech launch party on the first day of the conference, which uh, means that they are a little bit, well, I'm discovering they're a little bit further along than I realized, but the more early stage companies being featured on that day and one that really stood out for me. Uh, Chrissy, thanks for taking the time to talk. I'm happy to be here. So one of the things, I'll let you kind of explain the model, but you really refer to your, your, your business as women first financial planning. But I think it's interesting that it's not women exclusively. As you pointed out, you've got the, uh, you know men in your member base as well. Yeah, so um, Penny Finance is an online platform and our main mission is, is to empower women specifically with financial tools and education so that they can pay off debt, start investing and retire with wealth. And if I back up for two seconds, the reason is because women are retiring with a third the wealth of men because of a major investing gap. And so for me, this company started as a very specific mission-driven project to get more women investing and close that wealth gap. But what I found out over the past couple of years is 
everyone who is just starting out their financial journey or acquiring wealth and does not have $100,000 in the bank to get an advisor wants personal financial tools. And they also are paying off debt and they also want to start investing. So this isn't just a, a women problem. It just is a problem for more women than men. So at Penny, we like to say our financial advice is gender neutral. Really, we're solving for that low risk investor and everyday investor who does not have a super complex financial picture, but still needs all of the tools and wants them to be personalized to themselves. One of the things you mentioned, which I'd never thought of that before, I'm thinking of the, you know, the, the lower pay scale for women, the, you know, the fact that maybe you take time off to you know, raise children, so that kind of cuts into your savings. The one piece I'd never heard until I heard you uh, presenting at the, at the session, women tend to graduate with a higher level of debt, student debt. Yes. That's amazing to me. I did not know that. Yeah. So since the 1980s, so this isn't just a problem right now. So since the 1980s, women have been getting more undergraduate degrees and more advanced degrees than men. I knew that. So just from that, right, there's going to be more debt in the hands of women. But then you add on to the fact that they make less. <clears throat> and like you said, might be leaving the workforce earlier or um, taking on different sort of jobs where we're not getting paid the same as men. That just sort of snowballs into two thirds of student loan debt in America, which is 1.5 trillion is held by women. So that is the first piece that's holding us back. That's just phenomenal. And the other piece that blew me away from your presentation, what, what the main reason I tracked you down, quite frankly, <laughs> is you mentioned that 82% of your members are credit union members. Yes. That just, I, that thought, that blows my mind. I mean, if you can make us too, thought, I, yeah. I, you know, I expected to see the big banks, the big institutional banks or the branch banks you see on every corning, corner, the national banks, but that's not the case. So um, our women in our community, there, there's a few things that are the reason for this age, location and needs. So from an age perspective, we serve women 18 to 74. And our age is skewing older and over older over time. And so I think that's one reason okay. why we're seeing tons of credit unions, but then also location. Our women aren't just in New York City, Boston, Chicago, LA, San Francisco. Our women are from every town across America. And the the more suburban you get, the more credit unions we see because that's, you know, the local community presence that's really um, showing up in our member network and then needs credit unions just by and large offer better rates on uh, mortgage products, high yield savings accounts. And that's what our members need. It's a first time home buyer who's getting their first mortgage. And so that is why we see so many people having relationships with credit unions and loving them. But I will say, Glenn, because I know you're really interested in this, that doesn't mean they're only financial relationship right with I, I was I was assuming as much I, I wasn't sure if we wanted to get into that or not but that I think that yeah, because you know you have your retirement accounts or at you know the fidelities vanguards of the world and then we see you know some checking accounts and savings accounts with uh, like the Bank of America's and JP Morgan's and then we see the credit cards across you know the capital ones discovers but by and large the the stat is 82 percent of our 20,000 members have a credit union account, whether it's a checking savings account or a debt product. So maybe not a primary account, maybe not the primary financial institution relationship, but regardless of that fact, that Correct. well above the national average. And yep. I guess there's some self-selection involved. It kept maybe kind of what you're alluding to. If, if people are savvy enough and plugged in enough to worry about this to the extent of joining Penny Finance, They've probably also done enough research to see that the credit union is a good option for them. So it's kind Correct. of a Venn diagram that way. Now, you just mentioned the 20, I think I wrote down 21,000 members. Mm -hmm. You originally went to market as a direct to consumer model, correct? And that's that's we did. that's we an did. impressive, I mean, you've only been, uh, I don't know how many, uh, and you've been in business for a couple of years. I'm not sure how long you've been live, but that's a nice base of business to have built up. That's And those are uh, monthly subscriber, subscription paying members? They're not all paying. So we have a premium model at Penny. We have, it's now 22,500 women have come to Penny, provided financial information 
and used our financial tools. And then a subset of those are paying a membership fee or their company or financial institution or a different community group in their world is, is subsidizing it for them. That's right. I remember you're also rolling it out through employers. Which, and you mentioned providing financial information. That's part of the model is you want people to share the information so you can kind of benchmark where they stand relative to their peer group. Yeah, I'd say the the biggest, the magic and secret sauce behind Penny is the money insights that we generate by looking into all of their accounts. So that's how we know that there are so many credit union relationships. That's how we know, you know, the average amount our women are saving and how that changes with Penny. And our secret is we don't just show you all of your accounts. We actually give you recommendations and try to be your virtual financial advisor because you can't get one and tell you exactly what you need to do so you can increase the dollars you have in your bank account today and grow your wealth. And so for example, one of the biggest things we've done is in investing accounts actually told you, are you invested? What, what percentages in stocks and bonds? Are you invested for your age? That's not something that's really easy to figure out by just looking at your statement. And so that's what people come to Penny for is to actually understand what is happening across all of their accounts, across all these institutions and what the heck they need to do next. Got it. Got it. So you've mentioned kind of your distribution model, you know, you got the direct base, but now you're looking more broadly. I know you're starting to roll out through employers. And one of the reasons you were at Venture Tech is looking at financial institutions and doing it through credit unions, especially given that you found credit union membership already seems to be a, a strong correlation. How do you, are you picturing a co-branding, a white labeling? What's the, what's the go-to-market from a distribution standpoint? Yeah. So the way that we um, are, thinking about credit unions and how we can help our members and help credit union members is a white labeling service where credit unions can use Penny to offer digitally enabled wealth management. Only one sixth of credit unions offer financial planning and wealth management services because it's really hard. It's costly. Um, most of the time you're hiring an army of advisors. We're trying to prove out you don't need that army of advisors. You just need really good tech tools. So our vision is the credit union member doesn't really even know Penny is powering their wealth management experience unless they're engaging with our broader community of women. They go to their credit union login, they log in and they see Penny within their experience. They see their accounts, they see their mortgage, and then they see their wealth planning tools, which Penny would provide on the back end. And you mentioned to me, obviously, uh, you, plenty of, you know, there were 70 plus credit unions and venture tech that got to see this, but there were also, I think, a dozen or so leagues. And it sounds like that's maybe one of the places that you're seeing that uh, that might be one of the, the, the aha moments from venture tech. Absolutely. And kudos to venture tech for what they've built, because I have been in the financial industry for 15 plus years, and I did not know what a credit union league was <laughs> prior to this <laughs> event. So that's the beauty of this annual gathering. Um, we talked to many credit union leagues and what another opportunity that has bubbled up that is really exciting is um, credit unions are already a part of credit union leagues and credit union leagues do an amazing job providing best in class platforms, education, tools, and services to the credit unions in their network. And the leagues are interested in subsidizing Penny for their credit unions, especially for the small and medium sized credit unions that might not have tons of budget to stand up their own custom instance of Penny. So we're really excited about exploring that opportunity. So hopefully we'll be, I'll be able to come back one day, Glenn, and share with you that, you know, we are available in a very easy, affordable way across the credit union network. I mean, that makes perfect sense too, because I know I was thinking the same thing on the small and medium-sized credit unions, you know, the scale situation, it might just not be very easy for you to go onesie twosie out to them, no, hit them all right. at once in a region. I mean, that's, that's great. So if people want to find out more, what's the best way? They can find me. I'm Chrissy, C-R-I-S-S-I -S -S -I at penny-finance.com, or they can just Google Penny Finance will pop up. We were named one of the best financial apps alongside JP Morgan Ally and a few others just last month. So I oh. hope Google will serve you up <laughs> if you just serve us up if you just Google Penny Finance. I will include the URL in the show notes as well. Chrissy Call, founder and CEO of Penny Finance. Really enjoy talking to you. Best of luck. Thanks, Glenn. 
So as I mentioned, uh, Penny Finance was my favorite of the 10 launch party participants, but it was a really good batch. Uh, it was not a clear-cut vote. Both I had a hard time deciding which was my favorite, and the audience did too. There were actually several that uh, did well. Uh, Penny Finance was kind of uh, in a close kind of battle in the second and third place range. Uh, the company that won uh, the new startup is called Peacefully. Uh, and they picked up about 20% of the overall vote, which is a sign of just how close the, the distribution was of what people liked out there. Peacefully provides end-of-life planning for um, credit union members and or family members of credit union members, bef either before or after a death event, which is obviously one of those moments of truth where you definitely want to have a trusted partner helping you out with those things. And in a slightly more commercial sense, we've talked a lot about the wealth transfer situation, the great wealth transfer as we move from one generation to the next. Uh, and having the credit union be part of that process is certainly a good idea as well. So that was the uh, the winner of the launch party. We'll post a link. It's very simple, peacefully.com, if you want to check that one out. But as uh, Chrissy talked about, penny.finance.com is, I think, a great place to take a look there, too. It wasn't just demos at VentureTech, there were also some really good panels, one of which was called Dynamics of an Exit, talking about the fact that uh, when companies make investments, whether it's you know companies like Circle Fund, CMFG Ventures, a credit union themselves, whoever's making an investment in these fintechs, at some point, that's going to probably turn into a, a sale event, an IPO event, something that actually means you're quote unquote monetizing your investment. One such situation came up recently with QCash Financial, which actually started uh, as part of WSECU out in uh, Washington State. And we've talked to them a few times before. Ben Morales, good friend of the podcast, we've had on a few times. Seth Brinkman became the CEO, um, and you'll hear he has an interesting background, but he'd been there for a couple of years. And recently, QCash Financial actually went through that, went that exit process. Let's hear a little bit more about that. I'm here with Seth Brickman on day three of uh, Venture Tech. I think we're all getting a little worn down over the course we of time. Are. It's, it's been, been a, a good but long three days. It sure has. Seth is the CEO of QCash for now about two and a half years, right? About two and a half years. Took over March of 2021. And joined from Amazon, which is an interesting path in yeah, itself. Yeah, I've got an interesting background with Microsoft, Amazon, nuclear engineering with the Navy. You got so. to see your Navy photo, naval yeah. photo up on the screen, much to your chagrin. I'm sorry for that, yes. <laughs> but you were on stage for a session called Dynamics of an Exit, which I thought was a really interesting process. And again, the idea idea that, you know, and with QCash, and we've spoken to uh, QCash in the past, we've spoken to Ben Morales and Denise Wymore, uh, it was started up, spun up from within WSECU. And recently, I guess, what I forget how many months ago it was, you were sold to uh, Aloya Corporate Credit Union. Right. So uh, 2015, Washington State Employees Credit Union had QCash as a product at their credit union. They were doing thousands of loans a month and recognized that the entire credit union industry would benefit from this product. And again, the benefit is to get people free from payday lending. Well, it's to get members out of predatory lending yes. back into the safety of the credit union. Because yes, payday point. lending is one type of predatory good lending. Point. Renta centers, title pawns, normal pawn shop, all of those are predatory lending. And so in 2015, QCash became an independent QSO to service all credit unions. Um, I took over in March of 2021. Over the next 19 months, we quadrupled. And then Aloya, which was a partner of ours for about eight months previous to that, saw the impact the product had and then acquired us in March of this year. So that's, There's a bit of a story in between those two that I'd like to kind of get to. You mentioned that Aloya, again, as you said, had been a partner. They actually approached you at one point, and you said, mm, no, we're not, we're not for sale right now, right? Yeah, they did. Once they realized the impact that our product has on credit union members' lives, they came to us, and they, uh, they offered us a, an LOI that said, if we ever choose to sell, they have first right of refusal. And of course, we weren't going to do that because if we ever choose to sell, we want to be able to go to market. Which was one of the points you made on stage. That's a, a counsel you have for any company looking at this. Don't That's get right. into exclusivity. Don't get into exclusivity. But what we did give them is a, an LOI that said if we do ever choose to go sell, that they would definitely be included in that mix. And we would uh -huh. proactively let them know 
hey, we're actually entertaining offers at this time. So that was more than a gentleman's agreement. That was it literally was. something written. I, I got the impression yeah. yesterday it was a gentleman's agreement. No, no. We actually, it was a legal agreement. Interesting. And, okay. I, and that was fine because we enjoyed our partnership with them. Right? Yeah, they, wait, were, no, they were a good partner. And there's no downside. Why would you not want to actually exactly. let someone, all they're saying is, you wouldn't go in exclusivity with us. Don't go in exclusivity with somebody else. Exactly. So again, fast forwarding a bit, you'd mentioned that kind of out of the blue, again, you were not for sale and you started getting a succession of calls. We did. So we weren't for sale. We weren't trying to sell QCash. And in about a two week period, I had seven different entities reach out based on our growth and our social media footprint and say we'd be interested in, in looking at investing or acquiring QCash. Now that's, and I asked this question yesterday during the session. I mean, it seems like a very odd coincidence. I don't know if that's the venture capital and M and A, you know, world chattering among themselves. You seem to think it has to do more with the visibility that you created via your social media campaign, trying to attract customers and members, not not actual buyers. I do. So my experience with with VCs or PE money is they are always watching, looking for the next acquisition where they can get a hundred x return. Right. So they're looking for companies with great growth patterns that they think will continue. And so over those first two years, we had an incredible growth pattern and they saw that. And I think it, the timing surely was odd that all seven in a two week period. Um, but I don't think the idea of getting acquired was odd because we did make a huge impact in the industry. For example, we just gave our one millionth loan. Now to us, it's not a one millionth loan. That's one million families we took out of predatory lending and brought back into the credit union. That's a great milestone. You, so, hit, the, you hit the one million just... We hit it uh, about a month and a half ago. Wow. Um, yeah. One of our credit unions in Lansing, Michigan was our one million You were literally loan. able to pinpoint yep. which one, the so one I, walked through I the door. I went up to that credit union and uh, we donated $10,000 to their charity of choice and we had an incredible lunch with them to celebrate one million families out of predatory lending back into the safety of the credit union. That's awesome. It was great. And as you mentioned, so you had the relationship with the lawyer already, so and you wound up choosing them as the. And you said you wanted to make sure that you picked somebody who would maintain the mission. We did. So you know, Washington State Employees Credit Union (WSCCU), an amazing owner. Their CEO was an incredible mentor to me, um, but they also provided the necessary guidance for somebody who hasn't been in the credit union industry. And then as we looked at our partnership with Aloya, Aloya carried that same thing forward. Their CEO is a very forward-thinking, innovative CEO. They brought that focus on the credit union industry that WSECU had and said, we're not changing that focus. We're keeping it a credit union product. And lastly, they had the resources. They had the scale. They are a very large corporate credit union with 1,400 um, credit unions in their portfolio. And they brought the things that I needed to be able to get to the next level, like a full HR department, a marketing department, things that I was struggling to get by on, they were able to, to bring to the table and really help us. And to your point earlier, 1,400 prospects effects. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, congratulations. I mean, obviously, this is not the end of a trail. This is just the beginning of a new chapter. But yes, uh, sir. Yep, we are. We're continuing to grow. Uh, we're continuing to service more and more credit unions. I have over 20 credit unions right now in some stage of implementation. And we just continue to get the message out that as long as there is one credit union member still using predatory lending, our credit unions have not stepped up enough. So I'm in 125 credit unions or almost 125 credit unions. There's 4,700. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. you got yeah. runway. Seth Berkman, CEO of QCash, congratulations and thanks so much. Thank you. So as Seth mentioned, a lot more runway in front of them. So QCash has already made great traction, but uh, the opportunity to get even further into the in front of all those additional credit unions out there is, a, as I said, kind of a, an offer too good to refuse that they got. Another really great panel in my mind had to do with the venture capital perspective of investing. And I kudos again to VentureTech at a credit union focused conference for bringing in a couple of panelists that specifically were more focused on venture capital from a bank perspective, including one from Bank Tech Ventures. You can't get more kind of specific than that in the naming. And uh, they kind of confirmed what I've believed for some time. And the, the direct quote I wrote down is, you know, economically, we all want the same things. There are political organizations to deal with 
all that I think is what I wrote down with the quote all that being the you know the noise and the kerfuffle of you know you know, the, the sharks versus the jets as I like to call it between banks and credit unions which I still think there is so much more that unites this than divides us uh, and clearly from uh, you know <laughs> the language of money and the color of money uh, they were pretty clear with the fact that there's not a whole lot difference and there's been plenty as uh, as Nick Evans said during that panel discussion, they had plenty of co-investments going on because at the end of the day, the solution that a community bank needs and the solution that a credit union needs really isn't all that different. Uh, so that's that's another interesting one. One of the other big messages I thought was a great takeaway was the notion of you know both the power of getting to know. We talk a lot about getting to yes uh, in terms of negotiation, but given the limited resources of these startup companies who are chasing credit unions, and here's where the credit unions have this reputation of being nice, nice doesn't necessarily always work out to their benefit. If, they're, if they wind up unintentionally kind of stringing along some of these companies, you know, one of the points that was made was, you know, if, if you're really not serious, please let us know so we don't invest more time and we can go on to find another credit union that's interested, interested in our solution. One of the reasons, because sometimes, in many cases, these uh, these fintech companies mentioned that investment is great, but a beta partner and a pilot credit union that can actually go out and help prove the concept and kind of polish off the, the go-to-market strategy can be every bit as important, if not more important. And on that front, uh, Mitt Rutledge, the co-founder of Virtus AI, was one of the presenters at VentureTech. Already in market with Wellby Financial, Richard Soule, their chief uh, strategy officer, spoke to us as well afterwards about uh, exactly the power of uh, what they're doing in market already and how it's already paying off. I'm here with Mitch Rutledge, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Virtus AI, who just came off stage here at VentureTech in uh, Dallas, Texas, and one of uh, Virtus's customers. Richard Soule, Chief Strategy Officer of Wellby Financial, credit right. union yep. in the primarily Houston area? Yep, Southeast Houston, yep. So, and, and full disclosure, uh, Mitch, you and I know each other from the Atlanta uh, regional tech scene. Yeah, great to see you out here in Texas. But I, you've got a couple of things that you talk about in terms of, again, the AI in your name. It kind of tells people what you're kind of going for. But one of the things that I think really that you really try to convey in your messaging is no data scientist required. And the idea is that you're trying to bring the capabilities of data analytics to credit unions without the need to staff up with what can be a very scarce resource and a difficult one to manage if, that you're, if that's not your primary business. That's exactly right. We, When we founded the company, we recognized that the credit union movement has a desire to be more data driven, but their challenges, they just don't have the size and scale to hire teams of data scientists. And so we want to provide that through our solution so that marketing and growth teams can get all the power of a team of data scientists served up to them for them to you know, be able to serve their members in, in new and innovative ways. Well. We'll, we'll, we'll edit this together. Okay. Okay. You also make a point of talking about the fact that, I mean, it's the Spotify's, the Amazon's, the Netflix's of the world that are really creating the customer expectation of a personalized experience. And frankly, these days, that's not what financial institutions are providing their customers. So you're trying to close the gap there, too. That's exactly right. We, that, that's sort of our pitch is we live in the Amazon, Spotify, Netflix era. We expect personalized recommendations in every interaction now. And we want to empower the credit union movement and financial institutions to be able to provide that kind of personalized product and service recommendations to their customers and members and, and really offer them up the things that we want and expect. One of the things you also point out, too, is this is not another data warehouse exercise. That this is, you're looking for, I believe it's 47 data elements to come out of the, the, the FI to, to fuel your engines? That's right. So we're looking for a, a very basic set of data to begin with. We obviously want to take more over time, but we want to get started and give them good recommendations with some basic information about the members, the um, accounts that they have and the transactions that they, that they do. And we can give a really great set of product and service recommendations to help them grow the relationship and, and, and build deeper relationships with their members. And that data is, for the most part, pretty readily available out of the core. Yeah, and my understanding absolutely. is you're, you're not looking for an integration. This is These are batch files you can pull weekly or You've something got it. like that. You've got it, right. We want to make it an easy lift. It's not a new data warehouse. We, we want to get a, a you know weekly extract of this data and then we're giving those recommendations that they can take action on. Well, Richard, maybe you can tell us a bit, because you, if I'm not mistaken, you were the second credit union that actually went live. 
So what, yeah. what was it that uh, kind of stood out to you from uh, the standpoint of Virtus that uh, made them look different than the competition? Because there are some others that are doing relatively similar things in the marketplace. Yeah, sure. For Well, for us at Wellby, everything we do starts with our purpose, to help people prosper. Uh, I have actually had the experience of running a data analytics team in the credit union uh, space, so I know how difficult it is. I know how expensive expensive it is. And one of the things that I've found is that uh, we as a credit union, especially at Welby, we know the path to prosperity, and we've done a lot of work to build that, and we're good at financial services, and that's where our strategic advantage needs to be. And so finding a partner who is aligned to that purpose to to help members grow their resiliency through savings, build wealth uh, through home ownership, and ultimately thrive was really important. And one of the nice things about uh, partnering with Virtus early on is that we were able to truly be partners, not just um, take a large product, but work together to say, here's the data we have. What can we do with that? So you had some input into the direction of how it was actually developed. That's right. And uh, one of the things that's really great about the product is it's not, um, it hasn't been in my experience a, you know, a precise data set that has to work a certain way. We gave them the data that we had readily available. They were able to provide uh, lists. We were able to make uh, progress really quickly. We did a pilot with them. In just a few weeks, we were delivering results. We had a indirect campaign which uh, had 25 times the conversion rate wow. of wow. of a non-propensity based campaign um, some of our results have just been really tremendous and allowed us to engage our members uh, a lot more than we otherwise could so we're delivering month over month something like four times the number of emails that we were previously but at the same time we're increasing the leveling of engagement so even though we're delivering a lot more emails we're getting you know, up to 40% more open rates wow. because we're delivering messages that are precisely timed uh, for their particular, uh, uh, their particular journey and they're relevant to their next step. Um, now these are for members and you're actually expanding the, the number of products in the portfolio for the members whatnot. Is it also for attracting new members or is that another phase? Uh, we want to do that phase. We, this, this part of our strategy for us is really about growing the member relationship. Deepen, deepen and the I, relationship. It's important that it, it, it's more than just products. So we are doing some great product campaigns, but we're also doing service campaigns. Set up your direct deposit, use our online banking, come to this event. But even more than that, we're doing behaviors. So we're running a campaign right now, which is a propensity-based campaign that says, um, you're close to reaching that one month savings. So at Wellby, we believe that getting to one month savings creates tremendous resiliency and is a critical Meaning first a buffer step. of one month of your expenses? That's right. Okay, gotcha. And so we then created a propensity list to tell members who were close enough for that to be an achievable goal why it's important. And they're then taking action, creating engagement. So it's, it's beyond products and services. It's about the true purpose. Got it. Interesting. And I guess you've kind of answered this already, but I mean, getting in so early obviously has its benefits, but you also have to have confidence in a young company that it's going to be there for the long run. So what, what was it about, uh, about Virtus, you know, the backgrounds of the founders, whatever, that kind of gave you the confidence that you wanted to cash your lot here? Yeah, for me, one of the things is they have tremendous resumes. They both come from SaaS, really? big, big data efforts. Uh, I've been able to work with some of the team members and uh, in some of my past life, I was able to actually use some of my expertise to vet and really see that there's a level of data science expertise which is evolving so quickly uh, that it's well beyond uh, my experience, it's well beyond the experience that I, I wanna invest in hiring. And, um, and we were able to pilot. So we were yeah. able to pilot really quickly, low investment, low risk. Well, I was gonna say, you, because it's not a massive integration, yeah. I guess the risk isn't as great of somebody, you know, suddenly, you know, vanishing on you and you're stuck with something that's, you know, bolted to your core. That's right. I, I think one of the things that's been easy for me to, to show my board is uh, it's not conceptually this can have an effect. We, we, it is doing it. Yeah. You've got numbers. We, low investment, low time. Here are the numbers. It works. It's getting better over time. Th that makes it uh, very easy for me to, to tell the story internally, sure.
Now you've got solutions that also, as I said, for member acquisition as well. It's not purely so, on. Building. So today we are focused on wallet share growth with okay. the existing customer base. We do see that as our roadmap that says, okay. how do we, you know, we, we know so much about our, you know, most participant members. How do we then use that for lead gen? Well, particularly so if you're bringing our, in data from other sources as well. Absolutely. So in 2024, I think we will definitely have more kind of direct targeting capabilities to do that lead gen. Uh, you know, new member acquisition kind of scenarios as well. But but for right now, and again, we see this with all the do. credit we've talked, credit unions we've talked to is there's so much opportunity to grow and deepen the relationships yeah. with the credit, with the members that we have. And I think that another part of that is also protecting, right? We know that there's this big concern about kind of loss of deposits and, you know, making sure that we have liquidity. And so we're, you know, really trying to, how can we help you protect to churn modeling, to yeah. focus on keeping the deposits that we already have as well. So again, focusing on the members we have is a big part of it. Can we do more and grow? Absolutely, but. You know. If I might, there's something I'm really interested in the platform, what's been helpful for me on the acquisition side. This concept of summit rate, which is built in, it says how quickly can you take a member from acquiring them up to a fully engaged member? And you know, for, my, for our strategy at Welby, we, we know that we need to create deep relationships so that we can help them change the behavior so that they can reach prosperity. So knowing how fast I can do that tells me a lot about who I need to target because it's saying either how do I need to change my products and services to, uh, to help members grow more quickly or what members do I need to target who are apt to grow quickly mm -hmm. in the organization. Makes sense. Makes sense. So I think you know, question for either of you, is it the marketing organization that actually tends to be the typical kind of day-to-day -day user? Is that who's actually using this data? And then, you know, it's, you're, not, you're not handing over the marketing decisions, you're getting informed on the best way to make those decisions. I think uh, one of the things that's really cool for us is there are multiple use cases across the organization. So I am uh, in the platform probably weekly looking at how, how, what is it telling me about our membership, how they're growing, how are we trending, um, my team, my marketing team, all the way down to the you know campaign leaders are using it to build campaigns, execute campaigns, create lists, and then I'm also engaging the entire senior team and seeing how our products, how our pricing, how our services are engaging. So it becomes a dashboard changes. for KPIs That's and right. things like that. That's right. So I think there are multiple use cases across the organization, but it's so simple that uh, there are many things that I'm. Uh, you know, frankly, not going to put in my CEO's hands. Yeah. This is a thing where a CEO can get in it and see how are we performing across our member segments. You know, give me a little bit of information about where we're doing well uh, in a relatively safe, controlled way. But also, a marketing specialist can execute a list from it, which is I think pretty, is pretty cool. cool. Mitch, if people want to find out more about this, what's the best way to do it? Yeah, we would love to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Our company is uh, Virtus AI. Our website is virtusanalytics.ai. Uh, so please reach out. We'd love to talk to you more about how we can impact your 2024. You know, you heard me in the session today. I, I know that credit unions in their strategic planning are asking me questions about how do we grow and protect deposits? How are we going to leverage AI in 2024? How are we going to deepen relationships with our members? And how are we going to do more with less? And we really think we can help credit unions answer those questions. Great. Well, we'll post those links. Richard Soul from Welby, Mitch Rutledge from Virtus. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Thanks Glenn. Thanks so much. So with that, I think we can finally put a, a fork into our coverage of Venture Tech. There was so much great stuff to cover this year. And thanks again to the folks at, uh, at Circle Fund and CMFG True Stage Ventures that uh, helped put that together. And I'm already looking forward to next year's event. And also looking forward to you know seeing how all of these uh, fintechs uh, continue, whether they turn into QSOs or not, how they continue to uh, progress down the road, how Circle Fund winds up doing with their second fund and exactly where they uh, target uh, their investments. Certainly had some, some great candidates on stage here. With that, another big cast in the books. Again, my name is Glenn Sarvati. You can track me down via my firm, 154 Advisors. I occasionally still go out and take a look at LinkedIn. Some interesting stuff this week about the OCC making a questionable hire to be their chief fintech officer and having to backpedal on that. If you haven't seen that already, uh, you'll probably find that if you uh, search around on, on X. It's probably out there on LinkedIn as well. I'd suggest you find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find the Best Innovation Group either place on Twitter at Big Fintech. You can find our grand poobah, John Best, at JB Fintech, and both of them on LinkedIn as well. 
Um, if you haven't, I mentioned before, check out our past episode of the Big Cast. Um, the uh, Thanksgiving episode was just before this one. And if you are listening, whether you're listening before or after this, uh, November 29th, our uh, weekly fintech, or not, not weekly, our monthly credit union t- town hall taking place this Wednesday, November 29th, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, noon Pacific, and we're going to be doing a special edition, as you probably have heard by now. It's the 10th anniversary of the founding of the Best Innovation Group. We're going to be looking back at the biggest technological developments that have really you know, moved the fintech and credit union space over the course of those 10 years and uh, really kind of assessing the impact they've had. If you get a chance to join us live, that would be great. Regis- advanced registration is required. Go to CU Town Hall. No fee. Just need to get the, uh, the advanced registration out there. And if you go to that same site, cutownhall.com, after the 29th, we'll have a replay available for you to check out. And we'll probably be talking about that more here in the big cast in the coming weeks. With that, if you're interested, you can always find us wherever you find your podcasts. You can find us at big-fintech.com under the media tab, which is where you'll find the past episodes as well. You'll find new content every Tuesday, including this coming Tuesday, as soon as I figure out what that's going to be, which is the way I like it, because it means it's going to be the latest uh, topical things going on out there. As always, my name is Glenn Servati, and we thank you for listening. Check back each week for the latest from the big cast. Or better yet, we hope you'll consider subscribing for free via Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet us at Big Fintech, email info at big-fintech.com, or visit us at big-fintech.com and click on the media tab where you can post a comment or check out our archive of hundreds of past episodes. See you next week.